Peace. What's up, on team? How you doing? Oh, man, I'm all right, man. Just taking everything moment by moment. You got a little time. Can you kick it for a minute? Yes, sir. Are you out of the living room? Out, 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 brother, out. Out of the living room. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? What's going on, brother? What it I'm, is, man? I'm just working. Um, I feel it is my personal responsibility to keep track of all pertinent hip hop activity and i've been noticing some activity in your direction tell me what's going on you up to something hey man look you know for, for the first 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 and foremost i've been a hip-hop producer for the last you know 25 26 years or something like that right and um you know i'm from that wu-tang large professor drop more quest he was at a new school there we tried to produce them back then and I was always a producer and a ghostwriter. I was always a producer and a ghostwriter. And, you know, I finally decided to put out some um, of my own material. That may sound crazy, but I was really satisfied being in the background. So um, I put out my first independent release, which is called Once Upon a Handshake, which is available on all streams. And, and uh, uh, you know, I lost the name Minnesota. So I had to change my name to Minnesota Money Boss. Okay. There's some, um, there's some young white kid from Minnesota who, you know, trademarked the name, which I could probably go to court and, and take it from since I've been in Minnesota longer. Right. But, you know, I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not a person of conflict. I'm like, yeah, let's just get it done. Let's, let's move forward. So I'm not even thinking about uh, another nigga with the same name. I'm not like that. Right. Tell me why did you choose the name Minnesota? Why, why does that name have, um, a underworld connotation about it. Was that a pool shark or somebody slick? Well, um, I got the name at the age of 15 in Sandy Projects. And um, at that time, my neighborhood was at war. And then the Puerto Ricans in my neighborhood were at war with um, um, guys from Cypress Avenue. So I don't know who they were. They could have been. Just some wild Puerto Ricans from Cypress Avenue. It could have been the terror squad. I don't know who the fuck they was. But at that time, Sam was at war with Cypress. And um, a guy jumped out of a car with a submachine gun. So my government name is Mark. And um, I was standing next to Puerto Rican Mark. So when the guy jumped out the car, there was a guy named Bimo. And, and Bimo was the father of, a, of one of the, uh, the sex money and murder gangsters named, you know, Bimo. Another Bimo, which was his son, but at that time, you know, Bimo had a split second to differentiate between me and Marky. And at that time, he just said, Minnesota, hit the floor. And next thing I know, the guy must have shot at us about 50 something times. And, and, and me and Marky separated, ran different ways, and the bullets was flying past me. And from that, everybody after that, you know, luckily I survived. But after that, everybody was like, yo, who the fuck is Minnesota? So we all laughed. So after that, that was like the, the, the neighborhood thing. You know, they just called me Minnesota because at that time I was chubby. And I guess he was referring to the to the pool shark, you know? Minnesota Fats. <laughs> yeah, Minnesota Fats, yeah. Right. Okay, okay. All right, I always wondered where the origin of your name came from. Could you um give, give my, my listeners some insight on... Your origins in music, where you made your mark at first? Oh, man. Music, um, the funny thing about music is I kind of got into music. I, I, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm a music lover. You know, when I, when I grew up, you know, I wasn't raised by my mother. And my mother, when I was a child, was a heroin addict. So I was, my, my, my family background in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx, not hot. And, um, my mother at the time, she had me when she was 13, but back then, if you know anything about the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s, everybody was slipping dope. The, the same way that we um, had any weed on the weekend, everybody was messing with heroin. She was messing with drugs. So at that young age, she brought me up to heroin, and my aunt and my grandmother, she had me, and, you know, basically not abandoned me, but left me with my family up to So I was born and raised in the Bronx. You know what I'm saying? And then she went back to her life after that. So I was raised by my aunt and my grandmother. So, um, yo. Um, yeah, I was, I wanted you to bring my listeners up to, um. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So production wise, Craig Mack, Biggie Smalls, Lil Kim, Big Pun, 
Ja Rule, Lil Wayne, 50 Cent, and indirectly 50 Cent because he rhymed over boots. I, I count the jerseys on this stage too. Max B, most left, um, Sarah Barnes, um, Grand Pobar, who brought me in the game, um, uh, uh, Sadat X, Gemini the Gifted One from Brooklyn, uh, Yak Fu Front from North Carolina, Lil Wayne, um, Baby, Scarface, Strip Daddy, you know, the list goes on. Lil Pim, Junior Mafia, you know, so, yeah, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I put some, I put some naughty by nature. I always forget the military. Those are my brothers, you know right. what I'm saying? I haven't seen Trench in a minute, but that's that's whole team and shit, you know? I noticed that you got a, a you got an actual picture with Biggie Smalls. What what project did you actually work on with Biggie? Well that was that was funny because um when I first got into the music game, um these these brothers that was managing me, my first manager was called Megadon Entertainment. And that's Roger Romain and um Max Goose and Jerry Griffith. Jerry Griffith comes off of that Clive Davis um table Max Goose and, and Roger Romain were the young and hungry managers at that time. And when they brought me in, I was one of their producers. And the artist that they had signed was Adina Howard. Me, Adina Howard, and Pudgy the Fat Bastard. So Pudgy got a record deal. They got him a record deal. And um, the song came up for Biggie Smalls. Pudgy had actually wanted this beat. So me and Pudgy was cool, but I was like, Nah, that's a personal joint. That's in house. That's Money Boys Players. So Pudgy was like, Yo, man, I need the beat. I need something crazy from me. So I said, All right, if I give you the beat, I'll give it to you, but you got, but you got to put my man on it. So the, the 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 deal was, you can have the beat for dirt cheap if you put Lil Tariq on it. And um, Lil Tariq got on the joint with them, and and that was that. We did we recorded it down at Giant Studios on Fifty Seventh Street, and it was an ill session because it was other people on the record. Who actually, whoever got those two inch reels, Akinelli's on the record and Sadat X is on the record. You know what I'm saying? But, um, no, they, they didn't make the cut of the, of the actual record. So it was, it was never released? Well, it was, it, the, the record was released on white label, but it was never, um, put out because Layla Hathaway didn't clear the sample. Because I guess at that time, you know, niggas was cursing, niggas was talking crazy on there. And for people in the, you know, people in the Christian faith, like, right. nah, this is, I'm not, y'all make none of us ain't gonna do this to my dad shit. Right. You know? <laughs> okay. All right. So we didn't get that. And I think that, I mean, that was one of big, I had some, I got some unreleased records with big. I got, if you look on YouTube, there's a joint called White Shark Part 2. And, 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 oh my God, I don't know who got that real brother, but, whew, baby, incredible. Wow. Okay. So, um, aside from Biggie, how, how, I, I, I have to ask you this. How did you, how were you introduced to Biggie? How did you meet him? Biggie, the funny thing is, at that time, when you were rhyming, you were either down in Washington Square or or everybody, everybody who was coming up in the rap game was trying to catch up to Maddie C. Maddie C, but Maddie C is Matt, Mateo Capilongo. And he ends up being an A and R for Loud Records. But Maddie was like the bridge between the street and you getting your life together. So every nigga that rhymed in the city was looking for Maddie C. Maddie threw a talent show down at the, at the meat packing district. On, at a spot in 13th Street and everybody who was somebody in the rap game performed at this talent show. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Stinky Me and Tariq, Stinky Big, Stinky DMX. I'm talking about straight off the hood. Niggas drinking 40 ounces, don't got no haircut, $3 in their pocket type shit. You know what I'm saying? So, um, at this talent show at the Mars, that's why I initially met Big. Maddie introduced us. And we just clicked. We was cool. But it was like, all right, yo, that's, that's the Brooklyn niggas that rhyme. You know, that, that's the big dude from Brooklyn. And I always genuinely, I never had a problem with Brooklyn niggas. You know what I'm saying? Even me being from Uptown, being from the Bronx. You know, a lot of people push that Bronx, Brooklyn separation. But those was the niggas I got along with the fucking most. Mm. The Brooklyn niggas. Um, um, tacking them and buckshot them. So at this time, when Maddie threw this talent show, there was a lot of people in there. And, um, that's when I initially met Big. 
and, and vibed out with him. And as I continued on in the industry, I bumped into him again. We took it from there. He got his deal with Puff. I started going out to the house. I missed the first album. And um, when I went out there, and, and probably because of, um, I possibly missed the first album because there was a little infraction with Puffy because of how um, we, we had a bad introduction, you know? You and Diddy? So, Say yes. You and Diddy had a bad introduction? Yeah, yeah, because, um, you know, some guys from my neighborhood that was really out in the field playing hard, they was partying, and, you know, when they got back to the neighborhood, they was like, yo, you know, we partied with Puffy, da 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 I didn't know that there was a little physical infraction, and at that time, you know, my niggas was like, well, some of the kings of New York on the street level at that time, and they were young, and they were the young up-and-coming niggas who would challenge any older nigga who thought he was about that life. So, um, you know, when me and my man went down to Bad Boy to meet Puffy, as we going up in one elevator, Puffy's going down in the other elevator. Mm -hmm. So I never got to meet Puff on good terms. And, I, and I, I'm looking at it as a producer, as an ex-street nigga at this time, where it's like, oh, shit, all right, I'm getting ready to fuck with Bad Boy. But it was all bad, and I didn't know it. Okay, you know? hold on, hold on, hold on, Minnesota. Was this your people from Soundview? Yes, yes. Do you care to elaborate? Like, I don't want to well, leave my, I don't want to leave my, I don't want to leave my yes. listeners in the dark. Right. So this was my friend Pistol Pete, who was actually, you know, way about that life. You know? So he, he, who, so who to us was, who to us was Danger Mouse, Little Pete. You know, he had a bunch of different names, you know, to us, you know. Okay, so. um Pete came to you and said we was partying with, with Diddy last night, but he didn't no, say... No, uh, another guy... No, no, Pete didn't say another guy named Steiny. And then when Steiny told me, I got in contact with Pete. Okay. So I called Pete, he was like, yo, yeah, yeah, we was in Puff, so, you know, all right, cool. When I come back from North Carolina, we're going to go down to Bad Boy. Okay, you know? but they didn't tell you that when they was with him, they had him under pressure. Yeah, no, well, it wasn't... Nobody was see The thing with Pete that was, you know, a, lot, a big misconception about Pete was... Pete wasn't a um, extortionist. He wasn't a robber. He was actually a gentleman. But the problem that I think he may have had was he didn't look like who he was. So it was like a pretty boy nigga who would go all the way with you. You know how niggas want to try to, the cool looking niggas with the nice clothes. Right, and right, right. Jewelry. I go through that all the time. <laughs> right, so that's, that was, that was the thing. But the problem was, you know, um, you know, how that nigga, that, that, that nigga, uh, 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 uh Nori say, animal thug, you know what I'm saying? He was, he was an animal thug, but he was just a well-dressed, he was just a well-dressed villain. Right. So, if you don't, if you, if you, if you don't mind, how did they have some, t how did they cross paths that would become, something um, acrimonious? Something, something happened in Manhattan Center. So, with whatever happened in Manhattan Center at a Peter Shoe party, Allegedly, something happened and, and Wolfie stood down. Because that was the whole thing. Since Wolf was the strength at that time, and people already knew, like, yo, this kid is going to go all the way with you. Whatever happened, happened. And, um, you know, I, I can only give my accurate representation based on how it came back to me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So all I know was allegedly, you know... Let me get a little bit of clarity. Let me get a little bit of clarity. When, when, whenever Pistol P had this encounter with Diddy, Wolf was there. Yeah, it was in a, uh, it was in Manhattan Center at a Peter Shoe party. Okay. You know, so I don't know the full details of whatever happened, but whatever happened, it, it, it landed on a good foot. Numbers was exchanged, and you know, from there, you know, from 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 there, um. I tried to make the communication and the contact, but I think the way it came across was like, yo, you know, because I got from one of my good friends from the Bronx that was in the music industry too, he came back like, yo, why the, why the guy Minnesota put this guy on me? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's how he right, felt? It wasn't, it, wasn't a put it, it wasn't an extortion thing. It wasn't a put it on him. It was, yo, I used to be in the street. I'm a producer. You know, they doing things down there. I want to come down and work. So that's what it really was. It wasn't a thing where it was like a, ever a bad foot 
or a beef with Puff. Right. Was it received like you sent him down there to talk to him? I mean, when we, no, when we went there, it was me and Pete. That was it. It was just me and Pete. Oh, okay. Jumping the bins and we went down the bad boy. Okay. But as we were going down the bad boy, you know, we found out later. But as we were coming up on the elevator, Puffy was going down. He got out of there. Oh, okay. So y'all just missed him. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Or, or either he didn't want to have that meat. Give me some. Um... It was just an introduction. Like, yo, this is my man. He's doing music. Da 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 blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was, it was, um, you know, as I look back at it now, when we walked in that office, it was like time stopped. If you know what I mean. Right. You know, when you have, when you, when, when people are on top and you coming through, it was an eerie feeling. When I, as I look back at it now as a grown man, you know, sometimes, you know, this is my, this is my friends and, and, and associates and, and good close family type friends, but these niggas is terrorists to the world. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, man, that, 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 that was, that was about that, you know? <clears throat> Give me, um, the history on Money Boss Players in its infancy stages. Where did y'all come up with the name, first of all? The money, you know, you know what's funny? When, when we had made the unsigned hype, right? And when we made the unsigned hype, Maddie C put us in there, if I'm correct, as Lost in the Ink. I don't know. But Money Boss Players, it was six people. Kind of like Wu Tang was, and if, mind you, we were before everybody. We dropped the album in 1992 called the Ghetto Chronicle Daily, which is still sort of sought after as an underground classic, and we only pressed to be a thousand to fifteen hundred copies of it. But we were looking for a name when we got into music, and it was it was six people in the group, and it was two groups each. Right. Big Iron C Dub was questions and answers. They were from Soundview. Eddie Chiba and Trey Bag. They were from the Western Grand Concourse area, and then me and Tariq, who were from Salem. You know what I'm saying? So, um, it was six people, three groups, you know, and, and we were trying to do the Wu Tang thing before Wu Tang, but unbeknownst to us at that time, from areas like Bad Boy and other powerful people, people was like, nah, don't fuck with them. You know what I'm saying? Because all the shit that's regular now, you know, niggas getting shot and crazy shit happening. The, the you know, the, 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 the cloth that we came off of, you know, we was, we went and did a, let, let's just say this, we went and did a, a video for Wu Tang, right? It was for K Def and Larry O. Right. And it was, it was a real live shit video, right? And I think it was in Brooklyn. And we went out there, about 20 of us, we must have had about 19 guns. Mm hmm. NYPD on the scene and all that, we didn't give a fuck. I've seen in a, um, I remember when y'all came out in the magazines, uh, right. there was a reputation with y'all. I remember hearing, um, I remember hearing that it was a dude, they was like, it's a dude named Lord Tariq. And, uh, he, 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 he like up there with Nas and Jay-Z and them niggas. And right. I'm like, word, they say, yeah, man, he be saying some wild shit. He, he, he was like, I'm the livest 85 or some shit like that. And right. that's how I was introduced to Lord Tariq because this is during a time when, you know, everybody was on the righteous side. Everybody was right. righteous. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and a statement like that, I'm the livest 85 or that was extremely um, taboo and barbaric. Right. <laughs> like, I right, mean, right. And one of his first mixtape rhymes, he said, I don't like white Jesus, but fuck me, Bibles. Yeah, I was hearing them. They were saying, like, these dudes is kind of X-rated and shit. They were saying that right. about Money Boss. Y'all had a black and white picture in the, in the source, right? Yeah. Black and white picture, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember... I'll that to you, too, you know? I remember that, uh, that y'all did have a reputation from the streets. So, uh, right. all right, boom. Um... So y'all doing music, y'all created, y'all created basically a collective, right? Right. How are y'all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are y'all being received? Um, we were being based on y'all content. Y'all had some like graphic content. What were y'all? How were y'all being received? Um, um, talent wise, excellent. Industry wise, that's where it got a little tricky. It got a little tricky industry wise. I mean, the, the streets and the talent that was that was no problem. But when it came to sitting in them offices, it, it, it got a 
got a little difficult, it got a little tricky, and then the word got out around that time that we were difficult. Because the whole thing with the Money Boss players was, so we got six guys in the group, three of them are actively hustling, and I was one of them. So I was always in between the streets and music, and, you know, we were the first, believe it or not, we were the first ones to have a meeting with Neil or Cohen. And, um, you know, me being an ignorant Bronx kid at that time, I, at the end of the meeting, I cursed at Leo Cohen because it was eight of us at that time. You had eight or nine of us. You had three. No, it was eight of us. You had three on the warning ink side, which was Torn, Artie, and myself, which was Warning Inc., Fed Magazine. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then you had the other people who were artists in the group. And, you know, as a person who wasn't, I'm like, yeah, I said to Leo Cohen, nigga, you want I call him a nigga too. I cursed at him like two or three times. <laughs> okay. I said, I said, nigga, you want eight grown men to split forty nine cents? And he's like, No, but you have to look at the bottle you have to look at the glasses half full and not half empty. And when I look back at the conversation now as an adult, yeah. fully comprehending what he said, he yeah. was right in a sense. He was saying, look, I'm going to jerk you. You won't really make too much money over here. Right. But I'm going to put you into a lifestyle and a world where if you are smart enough, you'll make it. You can earn. Right. Right. He was giving us the consignment on, you know, y'all niggas are going to be very big very soon. Right. If y'all fuck with me and y'all got this talent. Right. Let me you ask you something, homie. Let me ask you something. So basically, right. In a nutshell, these Matolas and these Ivines and these, you know what I mean, um, you know, these Leo Cohens, these guys basically aren't nothing but investors, right? Yes. That's predatory, they're predatory lenders. Predatory lenders. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we got to, my man, we got to get, we got to start having some, um, some outlets or some vehicles where... We don't have to deal with them, man. Like we, we're, we're, we're the black financiers. At was there really? black financiers at during this time period? At, 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 during during this time, I'm gonna tell you, and I got a ton of respect for him. And I don't know how the man feels about me. I don't, you know, but I have a ton of respect for the Puffies of the game, the Steve Stouts, because a lot of these guys that are major now, like the, a lot of niggas was working in the mail room. Bert, Lenny S. Like, they were, like, at that time, kind of like, you know, street team guys. Just not to disrespect anybody. Yeah. Sean Pecos? Yeah. Sean Pecos, who comes off of, directly comes off of our sound you call off and, and the Money Boss crew. Mm-hmm. That was when he got on. Right. When Sean was ready to leave the industry, he was doing so bad. And, and, and when we was running around doing the street team thing and everybody saw that big light skin nigga with the freckles running all around the city because we made the news for tearing up the city with the money ball stickers. Right. And that was when Sean got back into the industry and called the niggas. We tore New York City up one night with about 12 niggas. We hit 14th Street, 34th Street, 86th Street, 59th Street, 125th Street. We hit every major vein coming up town from the village with the money ball stickers. Mm. There was one full night work, work, work. The sanitation was out there taking the stickers down. And that was that. that. That was when it became, that's when they were like, yo, New York City's going to find the record labels. And that was really because of the big, gigantic money ball stickers we was putting up. Right. You know what I'm saying? So what we, the only thing we knew back then was if we could get New York to sign up, we could get the world to sign mm-hmm. up. Do you think that's still an effective uh, method of marketing? Does that still exist? Yeah, and to, to a certain extent. Because we, you know, New York is bummy now. New York is not, New York is not the port. And what I mean by that was forever and back in those days, New York was the number one drug port. Yeah. You know, and, and from my height and knowledge of the drug game, like Philadelphia runs New York. We're no longer the port. So now that we're not the port, you know, niggas don't even behave like New Yorkers no more. No. You know what I'm saying? New Yorkers lost a lot when they lost that money, when they lost that thing. You know what I'm saying? When, when the, when, when, when the, uh, 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 when the, when the game changed and the crack era was, was, was in ICU, mm-hmm. New York lost a lot. It was over for New York. You know what I'm saying? 
know what I'm saying? All the fly shit, all the genocide crime left out. So, you know, um, the cartels, the cartels don't even like to cross the George Washington Bridge. It's too hard to get this. They, you know, they're shaking the trucks down, destroying the trucks on the fucking Cross Bronx Expressway, 195. It's over. So New York is really a wild, poor town mm. with no resources. Mm. So shit, Philly niggas run New York. If you really want to, <laughs> if you want to really know the hindsight of what's really going on, right. you know what I'm saying? Damn, that's heavy. On the on the on the market, you know what I'm saying? On 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 the on the black criminal enterprise, right. it's over with from New York. You know what I'm saying? What year? What year was Money Boss Players established? I want to say this is the thing. First of all, Money Boss Players, we were the orange top crew out of sound. Okay. My man Kwame, who's a born again Christian now, his uncle is from New York, but he was locked up upstate. He was in between Buffalo and Rochester. So, our shit comes out of Buffalo and Rochester because the Money Boss Players was a crew up there. So, you know, I never met the, 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 what's this? There was the Money Boss Players, and I remember a gang called the T-Boys out of Rochester. Okay. So, when Kwame and them came, when my man Kwame and them came from Rochester, we all immediately became the Money Boss Players, which was the Orange Top crew in town. We were the back of the projects. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, when we got into music, we were looking for a name. <laughs> we, we were lost the ink. We had all these different names. The Gutter Snipes, Lost the Ink. And then we was like, yo, why we just don't lose our street gang name? So we took our street gang name and, and transferred it over. And that's when everything like kind of flowed, you right. know, we just flowed into that, that spirit of the name, a money bonus player, you know? At which point did the money box players fragment, which led, led to Lord Tariq picking up a new rhyme partner and making a hit well, record? Well, you know what? Let's, let's, let's say this, right? Peter Gunn's was from 174th Street, and he had a crew called the Gunrunners. Tariq from Soundview, um, you know, Money Boss Players. We was the only rhyme crew out of Soundview Projects, and off of 174th Street at that time, Peter, who was Peter Lovell, who turned to Peter Guns, he, he turned to Peter Guns after he got at his gun case, and then his crew turned to the Gunrunners, right? Okay. And, um, the, 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 the form, the formation of them getting together was Lord Tariq is Peter Gunn's brother-in-law. He's been with Peter Gunn's sister. Sister, right. For yep. fucking 30 years now, mm -hmm. or more. Yeah, he told me the story. That's right. That's you right. You know what I'm saying? So that's how, that's how that correlation came about. And, you know, Peter, Peter to this day is like, He's, he's like family with us, man. Like that, there ain't no separation or no shit like that. So, you know, as I, if, if I look, if, if, if I'm 20 years old, 19 years old, I'm like, yo, this nigga Tariq is shitting with us. But now as an adult man, fucking, uh, 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 20 something years later, I'm like, all right, I had a lot of niggas with me. And, you know, when you experience success, Sometimes you don't want to bring the nigga shit to your party. You know what I'm saying? So I could, I could actively say as an adult, Tariq was probably ducking a bunch of nigga shit. You know, oh, like, um, oh, okay. He went to go, he went to go, he went to go get his dribble right. He went to go get his dribble right. You know, listen, he was getting his dribble right. And, you know, of, of course he had, he picked up some other gangsters from Bronx River and 174th Street. He had, he had a lot of Peter Guns' gangsters with him, right? Mm -hmm. But, I came with a whole other side of town of gangsters. You know what I'm saying? So, it was like, you know, and when I look back now, it was a lot of shit where like, we were, we was in New York undercover. We got real tight with Ice T. Ice T was our guy. And, um, what um what episode was y'all in? I love that show, man. I would love, um, to, I would I love to see I can't, it. I can't remember, but... You, you know, know what? You know what, though? I do remember y'all music on there. Right. Now, we almost... This particular night, we almost... It was almost the Bronx versus New Jersey because it was Red Band and Naughty by Nature down here. Mm -hmm. And we almost got into it and everything got cleaned up. It got straightened out. But it was almost a real situation because, like I said, you know, you, you when you're young... You think you're thinking, 
but you're hot headed and your thinking cap ain't really on. Right. You know what I'm saying? A nigga in his, in his teens, in his 20s, you, you start to get it together 25, 26, 27, 28. Why you young? You still into, yo, I'm repping this and I'm from here and these my niggas. Come on, yo, we gotta, you know, it's just like room boy time. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that I was at full blame, but, you know, at the same time, you know, Tariq was trying to get his thing together. And as I, and, and, and I brought him into opportunity. That's the funny thing. I introduced him to his managers at that time, which was Eric Beasley, Kevin Mitchell, and another guy named Frank that died. So, Tariq had got a, a gig right for Shaquille O'Neal. So I'm like, oh, shit, it's on now. So instead of bringing me down to Florida to fuck with Shaquille O'Neal, he brought Peter Guns. Mm -hmm. The rest is and, you know, At the time, there, Peter's my friend, but I'm still highly offended. Like, who sucked this nigga, Lord? You know what I'm saying? And it was just, when I look back now, it was just an issue of the nigga, nigga shit. So... Me and Twan from Fence Magazine, who's a high school friend, he's all the way from another side of the uh, He's from the north, Northwest Bronx. Right. But you know, he went to high school with us, so we jump on a plane, we go down to Florida, and we basically bull guarded our way into um, <laughs> Shaq's mansion. Right. You know what I'm saying? So we got down there, we was around. It was an uncomfortable situation because it was like, you know, Tariq is looking up now, looking to feel a little guilty at that time. Like, oh, shit, these niggas is here. Right. We down there. We... We so ignorant at this time. We down in Florida. With, we down the land of Florida with bubble boosters because it was freezing in New York. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That was really our first time in Florida, early 90s. Never you know been saying? nowhere. Right. 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 So we down there and, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the brother from Florida. I mean, brother from Queens. It was a, Frank was from Brooklyn and his partner was from Queens. His, fa his partner put out, um, Hassan Poor, he put out the Godfathers of rap, and, and, and it was insinuating that hip hop started in Queens. Okay. So yeah, he put out the Godfathers um, of of hip hop documentary, something like that. Godfathers of rap, which was hitting that um, hip hop started. He put it out for controversy and made money, right. which was smart. But you know, we went down there. You know, everything panned out. Everything was good. But um, you know, we just you know we pried into it to see what the fuck was going on. You know. No doubt, no doubt. So, uh, what was the end result? Did you did you end up contributing to anything constructive while you were there? Well, I, I sold some beats to Shaq. I think I, I'm on one of the Shaquille O'Neal albums. Where I took a, a, a Smokey Robinson sample and hooked him up something crazy. You know what I'm right. saying? So, yeah, um, and, and I think um, Tariq wrote the song for Shaq or Peter Guns. Like, yo, look, at the end of the day. Like I said, when you're young, you misconstrue certain things. And I would say, like, you got to understand, coming out of the projects, Tariq is poor. He's getting a shot at life. He's around the creature comfort now. You know what I'm saying? You coming from, I mean, fuck, for years, Tariq held all the guns for everybody right. in the projects. You know what I'm saying? Him being a neutral one, him being the riff, being the top rap nigga out the projects. I mean, hey, look, he was the base. Right. He held all the all the all the rocket launches to recap. You know? Oh wow. <laughs> so um you know, just to make a long story shorter, um, you know, I I, I would attribute it to Tariq was getting a taste of the creature comfort. Because mm -hmm. at that time, Tariq wasn't knee deep in the game. He dibbled and dabbled, but he wasn't really the one who was out there. You know, going to towns, going to Springfield, Massachusetts, going to D.C. Um, I had the block in Midtown Manhattan, which I got shot up on at right. 19 years old. So he he was, it was these things that led me to him. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I remember when he did his first demo, and they had the big radio playing that shit in the process. I'll never forget when I heard his voice. That was the moment. They had the... He, to me, comes from like the five percenters in the back of the project. Right. So it was him, Boyd, Father Jaquan, Tashim. They were all in the back and they were blasting Tariq's demo on repeat, right? Right. But when I heard his voice, I heard him kicking all this five percent of De La Soul type shit. And me and at that time, me and Tariq's older brother was on the, um, you know, we was in the trenches together. So I was like, nah, fuck that. Fuck that five percenter. 
I'm getting fuck that five percent of shit. I'm getting with him. We gonna do this drug out shit. Right. You know. Right. So, so the whole time that the, the Tariq said he was the liveest eighty five, he was actually civilized. Um. Yeah. 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 He was. Um. Tariq was definitely borderline because Tariq was in between fucking with the crack dealers and fucking with the five percenters. Because with, with Tariq, we, with, Tariq started a project and found me on the back on Sue and Metcalf, which was a back building. Right. At that time, the niggas back then wasn't really about getting money. Some of them was robbing, you know what I'm saying? Um, it was like K-Ron, uh, Father J. Kwan, Tashim, the, the Universal Zig Zag Zig. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? The brothers back then, that was the 5% of part of the project. So them niggas was kind of like old school to us. Right. You know what I'm saying? Not, I'm not saying Lord, but Lord was the nigga who branched off from them and kind of fucked with us. And he was the one wearing the... Mondo Ormo Leathers and he had the curly hair and we gravitated to Tariq because Tariq had all the bitches coming to the projects. Oh yeah? Tariq was a player? Oh man. <laughs> a, player. <laughs> a, player is a, a player with the bitches is an understatement. All right. So um boom. When y'all um y'all money boss players, at which point does Sex Money Murder, which was a neighborhood <laughs> organization, well, at, at, at which when, point? when by the time that most of us were dibbling lightly and getting out of the game and seeing a new opportunity, and you know, I think um, when I started getting my first checks from the music industry as a producer, and my friends around me started to see like, yo, this shit is real. We fucking with this. We fucking with you, Vinny, because <clears throat> we were still on our excursions and. You know, trying to fig figure out the the Alpo A Z Rich Porter Kev Charles Wise Crusader Wrong Way of mm -hmm. things. And, you know, as once niggas saw that, you know, we can get paid off of music, you know, we started to distance ourselves from taking those high risks. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I would say ninety one or ninety two. And this is really the thing, right? The thing that, I'm, I'm going to say this, and nobody gives these people props for whatever reason. The niggas that made me want to do music, the thing that made me say, oh, I could do this, was a group out of New York called Mob Style. Okay. Which was with Y, Tone Capone, Gangsta Lou, and AZ. Because at that time, see, at that time, it wasn't cool to be a rapper. To be a rapper was some very corny shit. And when I heard AZ say in an interview, when he told Alco and Rich that they were rapping, they were making music, that Rich and them laughed all the way up the block. Like, yo, they was dying. Like, yo, y'all was in the studio. And they bust out laughing. Right. And um, at the time, also... Kev Charles had Big Boss Records, and at that time, Big Boss Records, he had a group called the Uptown Kids, and the Uptown Kids was Ron Browns, um, um, I, I want to say Murder Mook. Mm -hmm. um, so these were the guys that were, that, you know, back then, street people idolized hustlers, not rappers. Facts. When you saw LL Cool J come up to the rooftop, he was hanging out with Alpo, Rich Ford, and them. When you saw the Supreme Team come up town, they was hanging out with AZ and them. When you saw Just, Baby Wise, because it was like all of a sudden, you know, Harlem is a Harlem is a good place for shaking hands and greeting people. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm from the Bronx, but I ended up picking up a lot of good friends from Harlem because I had that mentality. I didn't have, you know, the full Bronx mentality is who you are particularly who you I'm digging in your pockets or nigga, I'm taking your block. Harlem at the time, the people were more diplomatic and they were more welcoming to hustling. Mm -hmm. So it, it could have been like, I'm not from Harlem, but if I open the spot down there, they just be like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. That's many from the Bronx. You got the spot on 8th Avenue or so-and-so. And it was like, compete, go. Right. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like, it was more diplomatic. It was like, I'm not, I'm not going to hate on you because you eat it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, in essence, um, 
and, and that's just man. Um, <clears throat> man, what was the question? I'm sorry, I lose my, I, you know, I, I be losing my train of thought. So Te technically, um, I was trying to establish what year was Money Boss Players active when active um, in music. I want to say ninety one because. money boss in the 90 um during this time sex money murder is a is a regular neighborhood crew well sex money murder came about right it's, you know it's so funny if you go and you look the movie juice that dropped right i was get, getting gonna get to that yeah right go ahead and when the movie when the movie juice dropped it dropped with a soundtrack and on on the movie soundtrack mc Pooh had a record called sex money and murder mm -hmm. which was pd shit so i'm gonna assume that they took it from there you know but it. it was a five-man crew and they all had baseball caps printed up i remember it was uh uh, uh, uh my man bro pete spanish kid named Melon, Bimo. it was only about six of them they all had baseball caps and at that time uh, there was a there was a, a ruling figure in our neighborhood. We had a guy named Henry who was head dogs. And Henry was from Salem. He was from Run Twelve. You said you Henry, said you hold on. You said hen dog, right? Yeah, hen dog. Okay, go ahead. He was from Salem on Run Twelve Street. And um, Henry, um, he ended up getting murdered by a civilian. You know what I'm saying? He had a little problem with a civilian. And when he got murdered by the civilian. His crew was coming up to sound me like the, 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 his crew at that time was notorious. Uh, uh, it was a guy named Jim Ice. Uh, it was a few guys, right? So they was coming up to sound me, putting pressure. And lo and behold, you know, I, I remember bumping the people like, yo, what's going on, man? What's up with your older niggas letting the home niggas come up here? And them niggas sprung into action. And <laughs> And, and at that time, when they sprung into action, it was just like an opening. There was a there was a void that had to be filled. So hold on, so hold, on hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. So when Hen Dog and Jim Ice and the guys from 116th Street came to the Bronx, Pistol Pete, I mean 112, Pistol Pete stepped to them. Well, he didn't step to them. They crossed paths. They had one big shootout one night. This is before this is before Henry died, so it, it, it was going to happen. They were going to clash, right? Yeah, he had a super big shootout between Lafayette and and Sound. Like I'm, I'm talking about Pete's crew was at war with the older niggas from Sound. You, mm -hmm. and they were at war with the the on 12th Street crew at that time. And see, the thing with Pete and them was, oh, we got Pete from Staten Island. They was getting the cars to come to Staten Island. <laughs> he had a mean team. That that first initial team was mean, man. I'm talking about, you know, as an adult, I look at it like, God damn, this is my man. But imagine having beef with these niggas. This wasn't right. no, these niggas, is, these niggas is driving Coleman Avenue. They driving the Webster Avenue. They driving the Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. They taking, they, they driving the Queens. They, they have some work in Queens. That was crazy, you know? So, you know, they were, they were real big gangsters. They took the gangster shit on another level. Like, if we got to come 
to Asbury Park, New mm-hmm. Jersey, and get you. Yeah. And matter of fact, at their peak, we were in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, going crazy at their peak. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about at the peak when I'm talking about niggas is going out there doing a hundred joints in three, four days, you know? Right. Right. That's that's when it got that's when it got real, you know? Damn. So, um, what where were you at during that incident that happened on Thanksgiving Day? Did you did you take part in those football games growing up? Well, you know what? I didn't. But well, at this time, I had moved out of the neighborhood because I had never saw the FBI in my life until they came to the neighborhood for for me, man. You know, I had never saw it before. I never knew what FBI agents looked like. I, you know, at that time, Soundview wasn't the indictment place. The places that were getting indicted in the Bronx was like right across the water, Hunts Point, Tricky, Cypress Avenue, Boy George. The feds wasn't really... I, once the feds arrived in Soundview in 1995, they haven't left. They've been indicted. They come in and pick 30 niggas up, come pick 15 niggas up, come pick 10 niggas up. They haven't left since 1995. Damn. You still in communication with your friend Pete? When, when was the last time you spoke with him? I don't, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the only people, he's in DDX, which is Supermax. Right. So the only people that can communicate with him is people with the same last name. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I don't really have that much contact with him. Like, he's Right. So if he came out, he was a little boy and he was like, oh, fuck. 